The Perimeter is brought to you in partnership with Speak Studios. Speak Studios. Speak and be heard. The Perimeter with Adam Morrison is brought to you by our official title sponsor, Mercedes-Benz of Spokane. Experience the best or nothing at Mercedes-Benz of Spokane with Dan Crowley and his exceptional team. They're located in beautiful Liberty Lake and his local family-owned dealership under Guy Automotive. Their staff prides itself on a personable and memorable experience from service to sales and will have you leaving the dealership feeling satisfied with a smile on your face all the way down the road. Back-to-back winners of the Best of the Best Civil Laurel Award. Receive invoice pricing on any new Mercedes-Benz in stock when you come in and mention the Perimeter Podcast. You can check out all their available inventory at SpokaneMercedes.com. As well, stay up to date on all things Mercedes-Benz via their Facebook and Instagram pages. Call them at 509-455-9100 to schedule your Mercedes test drive today. The Perimeter brings No Lie Craft Brews onto the podcast. Born and raised in Spokane, USA, No Lie Brewhouse is a hometown and international competitor made here. Their beers have traveled and won medals against the best breweries around the world. Over 46 international brewing medals and counting. They are not content. And they're always pushing forward to peak results. Grab a sixer and let's get into the podcast. Welcome to the Perimeter Podcast with your host Adam Morse and myself. We've got a special guest here. Um, 23 points a game at Gonzaga Prep his senior year. 56% field goal shooter his career in high school, 264 steals, 295 assists, 1983-84 WCC Player of the Year. We all know the NBA stuff. John Stockton, <laughs> I appreciate you coming on. How My you doing? Pleasure. Good to see you, Mo. Yeah, it's been a, a – no, we've seen each other during COVID and stuff, but, uh, yeah, it's good to see you and get to talk and, and sit down a little bit. Uh, we last saw each other in Indy during the Final Four – you had a few beers. I had a few beers. <laughs> it was a good time. You had some good toasts there at uh, what spot? Where were we at there at the corner there? I don't remember the name. It was a great spot, and yeah. uh, they had room for a, a kind of a crowd of wanderers. Yeah, to go celebrate the Zag victory. So yeah. it was a great night. It was a great night. We were uh, that was after the the UCLA game, the Jalen Suck shot. So everybody was obviously excited, and um, you know, again, thank you for coming on. I kind of like to start the show with how I've first met people or first interactions. So I told this story um, on the first episode with Corey Kispert. Do you remember when you used to come down and play with us when my freshman year oh, uh, at Gonzaga? You remember that? You bet. So, like, I always tell the story, like, you know, I didn't know, like, um, that you weren't, like, a big stretcher or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I remember you just, you know, you'd, you'd ride your bike. That's when you probably had the old house over, over across right, the street, right? Right, right um, on campus pretty much. Yeah, so you just – you know, showed up and obviously you are who you are, you know, one of the all time greats, NBA Hall of Famer. And you just show up like with your shoes already on, your shorts, and you like literally went up and down twice. And you're like, all right, let's go. And you just kick the shit out of everybody. Do for... <laughs> you remember those when, yeah. when Fee, we would have you come in and we would, we would uh, scrimmage, you know, you do the second unit. So it was like before the tournament, uh, either the West Coast Conference tournament and then the um, NCAA tournament. Well, I sure do. Yeah, I mean, that was a lot of fun. It was also harder than you think. I mean, we're, uh, <laughs> by that time, you're not, I wasn't practicing every day. Yeah. And, uh, and you guys are going full tilt. And so there's a conditioning, there's a speed that you guys were playing at that I think you underestimate. And, yeah. And uh, even, even for a guy recently retired, uh, it was, it was legit. So it was fun. I mean, it's, it's fun to know what you know as a, as a, 19 year vet mm -hmm. and these kids, you know, you're a kid at the time and, and you probably see it now is you see things they haven't even learned yet. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of fun, but it wasn't easy. For sure. uh, you made it look easy and I'm not <laughs> trying to, you know, toot your horn here a little bit and you're always, hum always humble. But like, I mean, Blake was on that team. Blake got drafted that year. He was a good player. Blake step and he used to kick the shit out of him. We used to give him <laughs> crap, but he's like, what am I going to do? You know? And then, um, Nobody called fouls on you, do you either, John? So, like, even Coach Few didn't have the nuts to call fouls on you. So, there's a lot of rips and go attempted on you, and you would just 
give me that and uh, go lay it up on the other end. Well, I'm sure. I, I mean, I don't. I didn't foul much, Mel. So <laughs> I, it, I'm sure there were none to be called. But uh, I guess that's it for the eye of the beholder. You, you know, thinking back, I was like, you know, how's he? How's this guy, the all-time steals leader? And then I played against you a couple times. Like, ah, oh, makes sense. He just fouls <laughs> the shit out of everybody. They don't yeah. call. That's all it is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's know how to foul. Foul the right way. Well, is back then you guys could do the you know, the forearm to, and guide guys. You know well, those I mean? rules changed. I mean, I, yeah. I, I didn't start with that. They, they, uh, I mean, you consider that might be an advantage. Somebody be able to st- put the forearm, mm-hmm. stiff arm you. And uh, that's, it is an advantage until Magic Johnson does it to you. You know, he weighs 240 pounds, yeah, whatever it true. is, Good and point. he can control you. So you learn, you learn how to play with whatever rules are brought to you that particular yeah. year. And they're always changing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that adaptability is a big part of it. I think. Do you think, um, just real quick, like, uh, you know, I want to get into your basketball mind, obviously. Do you like the rule changes, that how they are now, or do you think there should be a little bit more balance to, to your era? Well, I think there should be some balance. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's it's really heavily weighted right now with a three-point shot. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's really heavily weighted towards uh, scoring. However it happens, whether it's 100 free throws, whether it's, you know, 43s or whatever, they just want to see the numbers go up. And I think that's a bad strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the centers are largely gone. There's a few now that are kind of whomping on people because there's no other centers to play against. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I like to see the balance. I like to see passing, which I think has been limited in this, inside, outside, you know, doing both. Um, but right now I think they want guys to be able to run free, not be touched, and and – show their talents well i mean obviously as fans we like the skill aspect sure. and but also like you look at some of the score lines in, in a playoff game it's like 140 to 130 it's just crazy you know it's like you know i i made this reference on the previous show that i'll air before yours is kids now are going to shoot 30 footers 10 years from now because they're all going to practice them it's going to be a normal shot which is crazy when we grew up like if you shot three feet up beyond the three-point line you might get subbed even if you make it um, so I, I've always wondered, like, you know, you know, greats like yourself, like who played in the in that era, like, do you think it's good for the game or not? But uh, I think a little bit of balance. I mean, obviously, you want guys to show their skill, um, but I've always wondered, like, because you played pick and roll, you played open, you know, open, right? Kind of like they do now, but you guys were in the '90s and the hundreds. You know what I mean? Yeah, for scoring. And we did. We changed too, Mo. We had. When I first got in the league, we were averaging, I think, 115 points a game, oh, wow. which is pretty legit. It was up and down and running, mm-hmm. um, and it was physical. And I think you need to find those balances. I think the series that kind of hurt everything was, I think, it was New York and Houston, where I think the total score was, yeah, it was 85 to 84 was yeah. the average score. And so they say, okay, well, we don't like this, so let's go to the wide open. Let's not anybody touch each other. But I'm a believer if you're a player, you, you need to be able to play through a certain amount of contact, period. Yeah, and um, yeah, I've watched you play long enough. I, I you, you learn that. I mean, even if you're you're a skill guy, tremendous shooter, but you knew how to play with physicality and deal with guys that were physical with you. And um, you know, if I can get off the subject a little bit, one of Bruce Lee's greatest things was he 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 always said he could never reach the, the, his full potential unless he faced a guy that was good enough across him, literally mm-hmm. to kill him. And he said, because I can't learn to use his best shot, his best energy against him. Oh, wow. It, that makes sense. It, it does. And uh, I just thought, I read that a couple of years ago. I said, wow, that's it. You know, if a guy, if, if we are limiting the other guys where he can't bring his best shot towards us, then we can't ever learn to be as good as we can possibly be. And so I think that's what we lose when we protect skill guys and not allow them to be touched or, or whatever. Yeah, I think, you know, like, again, it's fun to watch, but... You, like you mentioned earlier, like there is no centers. Embiid maybe uh, is about the only back to the basket one, but he can shoot threes. Jokic is kind of a face-up guy. You know, he's kind of like Arvita Sabonis where he can make plays and pass. Um, so it's just kind of interesting, like, you know, like a Drew Timmy. Where does Drew Timmy fit in now? You know what I mean? As, as far as currently where his skill set is in the NBA basketball, he's a fantastic bas- back-to-the-basket player. Um, but it's just like, man, that kid's got to get a jump shot not knocking him at all, but in how the NBA skill set is, is like a back to the basket, low post uh, players kind of just out of the game. It's interesting. Unless somebody find, unless somebody finds uh benefit in it. Yeah. I mean, oh, if, you win with it. If you win with it yeah. and if you'll commit to it as a team and you'll, you'll build your team around somebody like that, uh, then it can work. But well, right now everybody's just doing the cookie cutter. Let's well, go. well, I think though the two, the, 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 the combat that John is the, uh, 
um, analytics that say it's not it's not good basketball, and everybody's using my analytics. I'm not saying you, I'm right and you're wrong, but it's like they say, like you know, that eight foot shot, um, you rather have a three pointer layup, effective field goal percentage. So I hear you, but also like when I'm watching these games and like there's literally nobody on in the post. It's crazy. Well, I watched Moneyball too, you know, and I, uh-huh. I I'm a fan of analytics too. I think it's it's a huge piece to the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. Uh, so I think some things they don't consider are are long long misses on three point shots, bad three point shots. There, you're getting a jam down your throat. You're going to get dunked on at yeah, the other end, true. probably with a foul. Uh, they're they're underestimating foul pressure. So if you're a great player and you're having to guard somebody down on the post at the other end, and now you've got to play without foul, fouling him, uh, there's no foul pressure anymore. Yeah. And so uh, there's give and take it to everything and analytics is part of it. I, I think it's a huge part of it, but, uh, I, I wouldn't close my eyes to talented guys that can win ball games and, uh, figure out how to put a team around them. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, let's segue into, um, you know, your Gonzaga years. Everybody knows you're a pro career. We'll get into that. Um, when you first got to Gonzaga, you were recruited by, I, th- I read, uh, Idaho and Montana, Montgomery, and then Munns, right? Yep. Yep. And why Gonzaga? Just because of the lineage? No, I. <laughs> the last place I wanted to go was Gonzaga. Really? I mean, I, I grew up on campus. I had been sneaking into that gym. Uh, my brother used to drop me over the door. They'd pull the chains out because the doors were locked with chains. <laughs> They'd drop me down through the chains, and I'd sneak through a window and let the rest of the guys That's in. Awesome. Then they wouldn't let me play. So <laughs> the last, the last place I wanted to go was Gonzaga. And I went on a few re- recruiting trips, and very few went to Idaho, Montana. They were great trips, great guys, great coaches. And I just didn't like being away from home when it all came down to it. Really? And so, yeah, so when I came home, it was a real easy decision. So you didn't want to go, but you decided to go. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, first, when you first started there, like, what was, like, the talent level around you? And obviously you're not going to sit there and be like, well, but – were you light years ahead of, you know, kind of the recruiting classes and guys around you or? Not at all. No, not at all. I, I thought they were the best players ever. Again, I've been watching them. I'd snuck into gyms and watched mm-hmm. these guys play for years. And I just thought they were great. Uh, in fact, this will kind of surprise you. I watched a USF game when they had Quentin Daly and Wallace Bryant, uh, two eventual pros, great players. Uh, I watched Gonzaga play them at the Coliseum. And when I got home, my dad says, well, do you think you could play for Gonzaga? Because they were starting to recruit me at the mm-hmm. time. I said, I don't know if I could play for Gonzaga, but I could play for USF. USF. <laughs> it just shows what I knew and, and, and what I didn't know. And uh, anyway, I don't know if I had a clear view on just how good guys were. So coming up in high school, um, I had a coach in high school, Pat Clark, who knew you and said that you were like the ultimate gym rat. Like he said you would play pick up, pick up, pick up. Is that kind of how you – because I think now kids – like I used to play a lot. I never like did I did workout drills, but we didn't like do workouts. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Now like kids are like made in labs, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of hard to teach, uh, you know, the just the nuances of the game that you get playing. It's so like you just obviously just went and found run, uh, runs around the uh, Spokane and whatever, or just absolutely no. It's uh, in my front yard. My brother, if I could talk him into playing, those were always bloody messes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was always unsuccessful. And then uh, I'd sneak in down at Gonzaga and play against college students and did that every night. I'd do that after practices. So we'd practice at prep. Pat Clark was there along yep. with Terry Irwin. And after practice, I'd go home and eat dinner, and I'd, and I'd go sneak in with the students down at GU and just play. Um, you know, there are a lot of Friday nights when everybody's out doing other things where I would just go down and hope that be somebody would be down there yeah. unrealistically yeah. and end up shooting by myself. So uh, a little bit of a weird kid maybe in that regard, mm-hmm. but, but I did love it. Yeah, no, I think, uh, like I said, like I coach my daughter's oldest team, and you, know, you obviously coached your kids. Um, it's like kids are like it's so workout, which is fine, but like also like you, they don't, you don't play against older people. You don't understand like what your weaknesses really are, how you get by them. And so like I'm always just like go find a go find a run, but then also like there's not really be as many runs as there used to be. Um, but it's the hardest thing to teach kids. Like, you got to go play against older people, get your ass kicked, and you figure out kind of how, like, how, how to survive. Oh, without a doubt. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's how I kind of, you know, uh, honed my skill, especially going to Gonzaga, like, in high school. Like, I used to go down before um, I was even recruited there. I would just sneak into the into the runs there, too, and it worked out. But uh, um, So, like, when you were at Gonzaga, when did – 
the pro prospect of you actually playing pro like become a reality for you? Like when did you you know like I could be a pro? Probably draft day. Really? <laughs> it was really slow. I, I know people <laughs> don't realize that, but um, my senior year, two of our I wasn't the best player on our team, and and two of our best players uh, with little pedigree at that time and and had averages and all this stuff got hurt. Um, one broke his fibula and one broke, uh, that was Bryce McPhee, that one, Jason Van Ort blew his ACL. And so we were down, we were down to six guys. Mm -hmm. We recruited a, a intramural guy to play with us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, there wasn't much opportunity. And then we played in the far West classic. I had a good tournament and then, um, had a good season, even though we didn't win the league. Um, we kind of made a valiant effort. We you yeah. know, down guys, we were in the hunt till the last weekend, et cetera. And so, um, and as you mentioned, I was awarded MVP of the league, which is w w rare for fourth place finish or whatever the heck we were. Yeah. Got invited to one tournament. I got invited to Portsmouth, which we had to pay my own way for. I got invited to Chicago postseason tournament um, camp. Yeah, camp. They, yep, yep. Didn't get invited to any anything. We kind of had to work our way onto them. And then uh, the biggest break I got was uh, Final Four was in Seattle that year. Uh, I think it was uh, Houston with five slam and jam. I played. Mm -hmm play Georgetown. Anyway, they were, um, they do an all-star game during the course of that final four. And I wasn't invited, but a guy named Ricky Ross from Tulsa didn't, uh, didn't want to risk his draft status. So he backed out at the last minute and they said, Oh, who do we have? Who do we have? close. Yeah, yeah. It was close. Can you get over, can you get over here in an hour and a half? I said, I'm there. And so I went there, played well in that Bobby Knight was there, uh, watching that game, uh, commentating on it. And when I returned home from that weekend, I had an invitation to the Olympic trials. Oh, there you go. And all of a sudden you can see that the, the, the things just kind of started falling into place. Now the Olympic trials uh, was brutal um, and it played pretty decently, I'd mm -hmm. say. And then all of a sudden somebody said, hey, you might get drafted. I went, what? So until that time, there was never even a thought that it could happen. You were just, you were just thinking of being a four-year player and. Right. What'd you, what you major in real quick? Business. Business, yeah. yeah. What dorms did you stay in? I didn't. You didn't? Oh, no. you were home the whole time? I, I, well, I grew up on camp. I literally walked to school every day. I was closer yeah. than I was to my grade school. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally had no clue that you thought you were going to be an NBA player until no, I, until that, halfway through your senior season, basically, or your senior year. Yeah, Dan Fitzgerald, <clears throat> the athletic director and my coach who recruited me, he came up to me after the Far West Classic mm -hmm. and said, hey, you're right now you're uh, – Projected fourth round draft choice, which I said, "Wow, this they don't even have that anymore." Yeah, it's only two now. Yeah, I said, "Well, that's awesome," but you, everybody knew fourth round draft choices don't have a chance to play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool, but that was it. Wow! In fact, when he recruited me, is his his sales pitch to me was, "Look, if you had any chance ever of being in the NBA, you wouldn't be talking to me now." <laughs> I mean, that was that Fitzy. Yeah, that was Fitz. So. Uh, rest in peace, Coach Fitz. <laughs> I, peace. I love Coach Fitz. He was uh, he used to do uh, the high school tournaments for us, and uh, I was ball boy when he was still coaching '95. Uh, and yeah, I learned a lot of cuss words from uh, <laughs> Coach Fitz. His favorite line was, "If a guy was he would do shooting drills in front of the whole camp. If a guy was shooting shitty, he goes go play soccer. You score once a month. You're the leading scorer of the league." <laughs> <laughs> he used to take kids and put them against the wall, and he'd, be, he'd do this passing drill and be like, this is how hard you got to throw it. And he would just throw it as hard as you can right in the kid's back. And I'm thinking now, and I'm like, dude, guys would get sued out of the gym like if you did those and those um, those type of drills, uh, you know, nowadays. But uh, Coach Fitz was great. Um, so yeah, that's – I still can't really believe that. I believe you, uh, John, obviously, but uh, I can't believe that you just weren't considered an NBA, like, player until, like – the back half of your senior year. It's crazy. Well, I averaged what? You were 20, 21, I think, in your senior year, right? Well, that was senior year. Yeah. But in a league that wasn't appreciated um, at all, I mean, mm -hmm. never on TV, never anything, uh, my averages, there was nothing about me the year before that would statistically that would say, hey, take a look at this guy, put yeah. this on your watch list. So I was on no watch lists or anything, and, and it's not like today. It was, you know, a couple – paper publications that came out it wasn't yeah no exactly like you could you could view players so much easier yeah. now obviously everybody's on tv you could get the, the divix and all that stuff and but uh okay so you get drafted number 16th by utah <clears throat> frank Layden was your coach um what was it like first going to that camp like what was your mindset like coming in the league were you still like hey i might not even make this team in your first round draft pick like were you, i mean 
Well, that's a good question. I, I, I first of all, I held out. Um, the minimum salary, I think, in the NBA at that time was $75,000 a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, as a, you know, if I would have played for nothing, as all of us would say that at yeah. some point in time, I would have played for absolutely nothing. And yet you drafted me 16th. So that's first round. So that's that warrants something. So they held they held tight on that all the way through summer league, all the way through uh, what they called it rookie camp at the mm-hmm. time. And they said, "No, that's what you're getting." And and I said, "Well, no, we're not we're not signing for that." And uh, that you know, advice of your agent, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I re- sat down with Jeff Condell in the training room with Steve DeLong one day, and I said, "This was while well, rookie camp's going on." And he said, "And said, I don't think I'm. I think I missed the window." Frank Layden got on ESPN that had just started and said his replacement's in camp right now. Oh, uh uh-oh. It was awful. It was awful. (laughs) So I said, I think I missed the window. I blew it. Yeah. So uh, a couple days later, I get a phone call that they were offering $80,000. I said, I'll take it. Did you take it just 5,000 bucks? There you go. I held out for 5,000 bucks. That's awesome. Uh, Do you, I heard a story, John, tell me if this is true. Did you have an agent throughout your career, like the back half of your career at all? Or did you just use like a contract lawyer? Well, kind of. I did. I did my own agent work. I yeah. Guess. So you uh, negotiated all your deals. Not all of them. Uh, f- probably my third one on. Yeah. Was that well, what was that like? Like, because you had a good relationship with Larry Miller, right? Correct. And, correct. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, you know, just from a business aspect, and like thinking of today's negotiations, I just kind of want you to, if you can, uh, walk us through that, like. Did you say, "Hey, this is what my market is. I know where I'm, what I'm worth." I mean, what, how is that like negotiating your own deals? I just think it's fascinating. Well, again, probably a lot more goes into it than you want to hear about. But first couple contracts, I was just glad to have them and 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 didn't change anything. But mm-hmm. then, but, but now I'm now I'm a starter. And your all star games and yeah, those mm-hmm. things are starting to appear. And and I'm not even getting years guaranteed. There, you know, that was kind of a standard. Is is if once you kind of prove yourself. Then instead of a one-year deal with a bunch of uh, incentives, incentives or something, or yeah. something you get a five- or six-year deal, and none of those were happening. So what I did was I, I hired a high, very high-profile agent, David Falk. Again, a good guy at the time. He was mm-hmm. by probably the most successful agent in the league. Mm-hmm. He took the job, and um, I think <clears throat> we were negotiating throughout that, that last contract year, and um, I heard in the newspaper that I said, look, I'll play, I want to play somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And that's agents talking. That's them doing their yeah, job. Yeah, you got to do their. But the moment I heard that, I said, "No, this is not the way. This is going to work for me. I, I don't want people to think that I would say that. I mm-hmm. would never say that." And um, so I, I told David, "I said, <clears throat> thank you, but but I'm a, I'm going to just go my own way on this." So he stepped back. I, I went in and met Larry Miller in his office one day, and um, he said, "What do you think you're worth? Write it down on a piece of paper." I did it. He wrote on this piece of paper, <laughs> we wrote the same number. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So, um, again, I don't know if I'd advise that for everybody. Yeah. Um, you don't, not everybody gets to deal with Larry Miller, but uh, he's fair and honest. And yeah. There we go. Well, uh, you know, like I said, I think it's fascinating mm-hmm. just to go in there and kind of bargain for yourself, but also you don't want to, you know, overstep the line. Um, agents can give you that, uh, you know, the relationships with that th- upper management that you might not have. And David Falk was Jordan's agent, correct? Right. Yep. Yeah. So like obviously high profile, I knew what he was doing. Um, but I just always found it fascinating because I've heard that and that you always just use a contract lawyer here in town. And I was like, did he really just negotiate, especially your, you know, your last deals were probably your biggest. Right. right. And so, um, that's funny. You guys wrote it down like on a movie, like a piece of paper, and just slid across yeah. the thing. And luckily, you were at the same uh, level. You didn't have to. <laughs> didn't have to haggle too much. No. And in the later contracts, I literally walked in and and he said, well, you know, "How do you want to start this?" I says, "I want you pay me what pay me what you think I'm worth," and I and that was it. And he wrote a number. He he wrote the contract, sent it in. We were done. Um, That's I mean, great. It, yeah. And that doesn't happen. I, no. I, I, I you know, if it was my son, I would probably say, "Don't do that." Mm-hmm. But uh, it worked out for us. Did you? Uh, I always. Wondered this too, John. Were you endorsement guy? Did you have endorsements? I did a couple. Yeah. Um, wasn't particularly fond of doing them. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. I did one that I really liked, and it, it got uh, it got kiboshed. The team we did, had developed a relationship with the competitor, mm-hmm. and so mine had to go bye bye. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> that was really the only one that I really enjoyed. Some the rest of them felt kind of I don't know, just didn't feel tacky right. or whatever. Yeah, I don't know if that's whatever. so. You but you never like. Like, I just don't take this the wrong way, but like, you would have been perfect for like 
Ace Hardware or something, John, <laughs> in Utah. John Deere. Like, <laughs> am I right, though? Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> Jerry Sloan had John Deere all tied up. He was a... Oh, that was his he gig? He wore the hat. I mean, he wasn't getting paid anything for it. He just loved them. He just loved them? Yeah. They so. didn't give him a free tra- a tractor or anything uh, like that? Not privy to that. Maybe. <laughs> so what was... Uh, talk about Coach Sloan. Like, what was your favorite part about him as a coach? Like, his intensity, his attention to detail. Like, what, as a point guard, like, what made you, you know, you guys click in that in that regard? Like... Because you've played for different coaches throughout your career, but obviously Jerry Sloan was your main one in the NBA. Can you tell me, like, what, what his biggest difference was uh, compared to others? Well, you hit, you hit a lot of it on the head. I, I think we, um, we we matched up pretty well in terms of competitive spirit, mm-hmm. you know, and that that was really – when you have that foundation, kind of you, you take the ups and downs and the – because we're all making mistakes. Coaches make mistakes. Players certainly do. Yeah. Um, you can deal with all that if, if you know that guy – is is all about you and winning yeah exactly absolutely and so uh we had it out a few times um but but i knew no matter what i said no matter how far sideways we got he'd have all our backs um Mm -hmm. if a fight broke out he was the first guy that was out there you know it's it's just the type of guy he was he's a foxhole guy and um he also uh, let us be basketball players yeah the times were starting to change and everybody needed to be a marquee guy or you needed to be a promotion guy. Mm-hmm. And, and he just said, no, I'm, I'm good with you guys being basketball players. We didn't have to do silly interviews to, you know, to promote the team or to prov- promote the league. And we just got to go play. So, you know, probably a lot more too. Yeah. No, well, that's cool that you, you know, he, you matched up with somebody, especially at the point guard position, you know how it is. Like you got to find the right ethos between a, a, player and a coach for it to be successful. And if you know the coach has your back, you're allowed to make mistakes and then you're allowed to kind of take risks that you yeah. probably, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the, especially early when you're trying to find yourself in a rotation or whatever, you have to be able to understand that this guy is going to let you make mistakes to a certain degree. But obviously if they're smart or logic behind the mistakes, um, it allows you to play free and allows you to play open. Without a doubt. That's with the, with these established players. Once you're established, game's kind of easy yeah that's true you know you yeah. just go let you, you go do what you do and you play with confidence and you play with freedom and the guys that are trying to find that that moment to get their foot in the door they're trying to figure out what does coach want yeah does he want this does he want this oh my god did he hate that you know i turned mm-hmm. it over is that it and, and so instead of playing outside of your mind where you're just comfortable and relaxed everything is is just tucked in and that's not a good way to succeed so yeah no it makes it yeah it makes it difficult um so in your 19 years playing, you only missed 22 games. What do you think was the key to your, like, longevity? I mentioned earlier in the interview, like, you weren't a stretcher. Can you explain to the people, like, what your philosophy was? Because I remember you sent me down after I tore my ACL to your guy. It was kind of the chiropractic stuff. Can you kind of explain to people? Because I think it's fascinating, like, today's science or whatever, but you weren't, like, a stretch guy or whatever, like, foam rolled, like, you just kind of just warmed up, right, and then just went. Like, can you explain how that worked? Or, well, you, uh, what coach used to say, "I just shake hands and I'm ready to go." But it's, it's, that's what I saw with just <laughs> those couple of days when you come down with Grand Zeg. It was crazy. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know where where the ble- your blessings, your natural blessings that we all have. Yeah. You know, I don't know where those end and and people what they bring to you uh, come in. But I had a couple of people that were hugely valuable. One was Craig Bueller. He was our team chiropractor with the Jazz and. Frankly, I thought he was a quack my first two years, and mm-hmm. then he just started fixing things. So, um, you know, sprained ankle, I'm supposed to be out six to eight weeks, and I'm back tomorrow. A little bit sore, but completely stable and functional, and I can play on this. And yeah. so, you know, some people wouldn't deal with the discomfort of getting treated. You know, there's a probably an, uh, an adjustment, which is taboo in the, in the medical world, yeah. slight adjustment, some muscle work. Uh, and I'm back, and, and I watched it time and time again, which to me is scientific, but it doesn't meet the scientific burden yeah. that I think most guys have to live by in the medical model. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to have him 19 years, 17 if you count the two years. I thought he was a black. <laughs> um, and then I had another guy came in later, Greg Roscoff, who ended up working for um, uh, for us and for the Denver Broncos when they won the Super Bowls. And, you know, John Elway was high on him and kept him through all his stuff. But he told me that you can stretch yourself into injuries. So this is, you know, later in my career, and I already felt that anyway. Yeah. That, but uh, he confirmed it. So these are two guys that know what they're doing in a in a non traditional medical way that that 
made all the difference. So me. like when I just give a context, so like when I went down there, like he has the the table that like pushed up against your limbs and all that stuff. And then like, he had me like hopping on one leg, holding a pill and all this. It was different, but my knee felt better. Like when I left, I went down there twice and it kind of like straightened me out. But, uh, like I said, like today's world, if you said like, Hey, I'm, I'm not believing in stretching. Like people would probably like throw you out the gym. They might, they might. You know what I mean? Well, I, one of the, I mean, you talked about, there's some weird stuff about it. It doesn't look right, but it's not, um, first of all, there's no drugs, which I love. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no surgeries, which I love. Yeah. I, mean, I just can't think of, if I can avoid those at all costs and still be effective, I'm doing it. So that gave him some leeway, but I, I sprained my back. Charles Barkley threw me down my back in the middle of a game, playoff game against Houston. And I woke up the next morning, I couldn't stand up straight. I'm, I'm literally at a 90 degree angle. Jeez. I can't, I'm not gonna be able to play, not a lick. And so I won't take meds for it. Um, you know, there was really nothing else for me. So he, Bueller and Greg Roscoff, the two guys, they got together down in Houston they worked on me for five hours a day for two days. Mm -hmm. And, um, we go into that next game. I, I didn't, I had not, it wasn't like it was, Hey, this feels a little bit better. I can do this. It was no pain. I'm upright. You couldn't find a position I could get into that hurt. Wow. And, and that's without meds. And I, and people just don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I watched it time and time again. And, and I think they're the biggest key for me being able to play a long time as any. Was that that was that the series you hit that game winner? It was. That's crazy. So yeah. the backstory behind it, you couldn't even like move, and you get treatment, and then wow. Yeah, but again, that that treatment was brutal. So there's. Oh yeah, I'm sure all, it didn't feel good. No pelvic floor muscles, and you know they isolate each muscle, and then they work on each one individually. It wasn't comfy. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's that's cool little backstory that you you ended up hitting that uh, three pointer at the buzzer. That was your first finals you guys went to yep. that year. Yep. So talking about matchups, like I always wondered. Like the, you mentioned Magic Johnson earlier, like who was your guy uh, opposing point guards that you had not tough matchups, but you were like, this is going to be a chess match with this guy, like in a playoff series was Magic, Kevin Johnson. Like, can you just walk us through like, who was your one guy that you were like, all right, this is going to be a fucking battle the whole time. <laughs> and I got a counter and everything. It's a long chess match uh, series. Well, first of all, it's neat to hear you talk about the chess match chess match and under, you understand that mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people understand that it's it's the I know that he knows that I know that yep. he knows goes on constantly yep with that in mind uh, we we locked horns with Kevin Johnson and the Suns a ton yeah in, in that in that little era he uh was a terrific player they're a terrific team and there was just no getting around I was gonna have to guard him over 40 pick and rolls uh, oh god he could jump out of the gym he could do just about everything so it was it was uh, always a tussle um Back east, we never played him in the playoffs, but Isaiah Thomas was one of those guys. Again, we're, I'm talking guys that are of like size that yeah, yeah. that you just couldn't get away from. Um, Terry Porter became a guy like that. Gary Payton later in my career became a guy like that. So uh, that you play six, ten times a year. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Did, did Gary talk a lot of trash, like everybody said, not to you? He didn't to me. I, no. I think he did He he did early, and I and I don't remember. He, at least to hear him tell the story, he did early, and I didn't either notice or didn't respond, and so it wasn't any he fun. <laughs> so he, he stopped. But. Jeff McGinnis I played with, uh, I think he was in the league on the tail end of your career, and he told me a funny story one time. This was in Charlotte, and he said, John made me – you know when you get so mad, like when your dad yells at you, you're <laughs> – where your eyes well up after the game. He said, he said one time after a game, like I couldn't get over the screens. John was, if I went under, he fucking whacked, you know, and then if I go here, hit the corner, he said he, he was after a game, like welling up. Cause he was, it, God bless Jeff. But Jeff was like, ah, I'm going to kick this guy's fucking ass. You know what I mean? And he said that, uh, it was, it was a hard lesson to learn when you, uh, showed up to town and <laughs> just kicked it. And Touche is funny. That's his nickname. So he, he told me that story one time, but I just laughed because I always wondered, like, you know, you all time great guys, like, who was your toughest matchup or who's the guy that uh, gave you fits that, you know, not the, the cliche answer, but like, you know, you're just like, well, Terry Porter was better at this than Joe Dumars or whatever. But do you ever, uh, you know, were you ever involved in like any fist fights or anything, John? No. No. In fact, the, the closest was like a face-to-face -face shoving match was with Joe Dumars, who I actually talked to on the phone the other day. We had a nice <laughs> chuckle about it. We both got a technical. It's my only technical I got for, you know, aggressive behavior. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, um, and, and really that wouldn't have amounted to anything either. <laughs> we were just bluffing. But, uh, yeah, we didn't have a lot of those. Yeah. 
It's weird because that era, they had a ton of them, obviously. But uh, all right, let's get into your dream team stuff. You don't mind talking about sure. it. When did you find out and how excited were you? Uh, I found out, remember, I got cut in 84. So mm -hmm. uh, I had thought that my, my Olympic dream was long gone. And then I'd heard the NBA was considering uh, using pro players. But, you know, if you're from here, like I am, that happens to other people. You yeah, know? it's true. So we're sitting in our, I'm just sitting in our house down there by mom and dad's on campus still. And, and uh, I get a phone call from Rod Thorne, who usually call, he's, you remember him. He's mm -hmm. the guy that calls to say, hey, look, you got called for a technical last night. You owe 150 yeah, bucks, bucks or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't about this. So I need to talk to you from SRI. And he goes, well, you've been selected to play in the, uh, the 92 Olympics. Mm -hmm. I thought he was kidding. I said, you know, I said, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, I'm sure. And I go, so, well, I'm going to have to talk to my coach and I'm going to have to talk to my owner because, you know, we're under contract. We have a duty to them. We're going to take a whole summer to play. Yeah to play, you know, for anybody else. I mean, it's all, you've seen the contracts. It's mm -hmm. all, don't get to do this. Yeah, no white rod or rafting. You yep. can't do anything. Anything, skiing, nothing. No. So uh, I said, well, I'm going to have to talk to them. And there was just a silence on the end of the phone. I mean, I didn't know how to take it. So I hung up with him and I looked at my wife, man. I said, I think I just got invited to the Olympics. And she, she did. And I said, so I <laughs> get on the phone and I call those guys. And they said, yeah, we knew all about it. It's been pre-cleared, which is what Rod Thor told me. And I couldn't call back quick enough. And awesome. then the enthusiasm did hit. And once I knew it was real and once I just needed it, okay it. Yeah. Wow. What was that camp like? The camp. Um, Cause I, I went to the, the redeemed team camp when I was um, after my, my or junior year in college, they had invited two college guys, myself and JJ Reg. It was Kobe. It was everybody. And obviously you were more established, but I was like, this is a fucking amazing. Just the talent. And then that, you know, the shooting contests afterwards, the one-on-one -on -one games, like, just what was it like? Was it cool to like get to know these guys too a little bit on a personal oh, level? Sure. You know First I mean? of all, it's basketball heaven. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think people ask me all the time about, you know, comparing the two dream teams that I was on and mm -hmm. future dream team. I, I, they'll never match the first one ever. I've never been around uh, 12 guys that got it yeah. to that degree. I mean, you didn't have to even have an offense. So, and I don't want to just start name dropping, but let's say player X flashes to the ball I mean, everybody's a good player. So before he gets to the spot that he needs to get that, the ball's in his hands. His head's already snapped around. Two guys are cutting, cutting appropriately. Everybody kind of knew instinctively where to be no matter what happened on mm -hmm. the court. So, I, I mean, I simply, like, let's say I'm the inner guy. I, watch, I just watched it play out. I went, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I've never seen anything like yeah, this awesome. anywhere. And it was it was constant. Yeah. It was constant on defense. It was, you know, guys could get up and play guys because everybody is already in some sort of help position without giving away their position on their own man. Yeah. It was, it was unbelievable. It was, it was like, was it cool to kind of sit there and then after the games and in between the games, like talk to the guys and just get to know them a little bit. Cause you, you know, in that era, like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure, right, there was no cell phones and stuff. So guys didn't, like, talk to each other or, like, hardly know each other. Now everybody's friends. Right. To some degree, or they grew up in AAU circuits. You know, like, that's a real thing. Even my, like, I knew guys, you know, in the draft before I even, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, like, was it cool to kind of just that curtain to fall down a little bit on guys and just be like, oh, this guy's not such an asshole or, you know <laughs> what I mean, like that type of deal? Oh, for sure. I mean, if you're – First of all, all of us that had done that, if we'd been to all-star games, and that was really my only other opportunity to be around these guys, mm -hmm. other than my teammates. I, have, I had good teammates, too, so yeah. it, it wasn't a joke. But it's um, – but so all-star games, you do it, but you don't get to be around the East guys. So we're West, yeah, yeah. East. So yeah. a lot of those guys were from the East, and all of a sudden we're there every day. We're in the same hut where, you know, if we have a day off, we can go play around the golf or we can go down to the beach. And so you're – interacting with them and largely only them because our families weren't with us on those training camps. Yeah. Um, it was outstanding. And yeah, you get to know guys. Yeah. No, I, I, I imagine, I remember that when I went to the, that camp I mentioned earlier, it was in Vegas. And the first thing I think coach Krzyzewski had everybody in the room and he goes, does anybody remember what Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen averaged in the 92 dream team? And obviously nobody did. And then he was talking about you guys were the, reason that USA basketball got to where it was and nobody gives a shit about how many you score. It's all about just winning. And, we, you know, we kept referencing that dream team, but, um, you know, I remember watching that, uh, documentary they did too. It was fantastic having you on there too. It's obviously, but, uh, 
I just can't imagine like the practices and like everybody's seen that, that clip of that practice game or whatever that, um, you know, it's like the best game of all time. That's never been filmed or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's secret. Yeah. Yeah, I've watched that a few times. It's pretty cool, but, uh, I appreciate you sharing it. Was it cool? Was it cool playing for like Chuck Daly? Would he just roll the ball out basically? Well, the, uh, basically, I yeah, mean, I'm I mean, sure they had a plan. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But, and there was a little structure, um, I know that he didn't want to call a timeout. Really? That was his goal. One of his goals, he wasn't going to call a timeout in the <laughs> Olympics. And you know, you can see why now. I mean, even the difference between the first one and the second one for me, we when we lined up across the way and faced the opponents, you know, you're supposed to exchange gifts yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And, and so that that's tradition in, in FIBA. Mm-hmm. So they're doing that. And uh, the other guys had autograph pens, you know. Yeah, they want you to sign stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, they're trying to get to Magik and Larry Bird. And, you know, they're, tr- they're trying to get autographs rather than come play. So we knew we were thundering everybody before the game even started. Yeah. Uh, the second go-around, guys were sitting across the way. You know, they were eyeballing us this time. And, and Oh, that's cool, though, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah, and we knew that they were going to be matches. Yeah, so. that was Dream Team 2. So who was on that team, if you can go quick? Oh, if, wow. If you have the top of your, um, top of your head. Let's see, Penny Hardaway was on that, David Robinson, Carl, myself, Pippen, um, uh, Shaq. Yeah, Shaq. I was going to say Shaq. Was Reggie Brent Miller Hill, on that? Reggie, Reggie Miller. Miller was on that. Um, uh, uh, Mitch Richmond was yeah. on that. I know I'm missing guys, and I apologize yeah, no, if they're listening. Yeah. But there's there's more. Yeah. No. Oh, I, Gary was on that team. Gary Payton. Yeah. I'm sure, more will come out. Yeah. No, that, that's probably like eight or nine. But yeah, that uh, everybody forgets about that dream team too. Was obviously really good. They've been good after, since. But what was the year 2000 that they got third? Does anybody know that year 2000 that they got third, and that kind of, that's when the redeemed team. Right. That was the it was the AI Stephen Marbury. Lamar Odom, I think it was that group, the Larry Brown group, and I think that's when everybody kind of had to reset and say, "Hey, look, when we come over to this, we got, we got to, it's got to mean business. We got to win. Obviously, this is our game. This is our national pastime per se, and we can't let anybody beat us." But uh, or 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 you got to select guys that are committed to not being, you know. In the, you talked about the presentation that you've all seen on TV about the first Dream Team and, and how that was portrayed. I, I think it's stuff that wasn't portrayed that, that was more fitting. It was the guys didn't care who was who was the guy. Yeah. And again, they made it kind of sound like they did. And I'm sure there's some of it going on, but it was behind-the-scenes stuff, that, that just committing to each other and to let's getting this done right and doing it right. As, as the competition got tougher and we got more into one-on-one style of play, yeah. It, it balanced the playing field. So I, you either have to select the one-on-one players, put them all together and have them practice for a year yes, together. It's true. Or you've got to put guys that do it kind of naturally, instinctively. Yeah. Uh, and that would be my vote. Yeah, no, I think the way they've done it now, they've made an emphasis on um, team, just winning. And, you know, like I said, that uh, Krzyzewski brought it up. It was like nobody remembers who scored what in that. They just remember if you won the gold medal. And I think guys – Got that message, but uh, yeah, I've always wondered because I remember watching that. And obviously, I was eight, nine years old at the time, and um, you know, it's crazy just to be able to sit here and talk to you about you know being part of that dream team as greatest team. You guys had got inducted to the Hall of Fame as a team, right? That's correct. Yep. So you've been inducted twice, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought, right? It's crazy. Yeah, and to go back earlier, you didn't even think you're going to be an NBA player. It's crazy how that uh, kind of all works out. Um, all right, I want to get your thoughts, John, on just kind of the last 20 years. You're a season ticket holder, obviously. David played there, Gonzaga. Just kind of your thoughts of the trajectory of the program as a whole. I mean, you've seen every era, right, pretty much. You've seen the 99 run and then, uh, you know, uh, Matt, Matt Santangelo's group and then my group, uh, Dick House group. But, like, where do you think they are now? Do you think they can win legit win a national championship? I mean, do you think that we're that close? I think obviously we've been to two title games, but I think you know we definitely have the chance to win one. But I want to see, like, listen to your take on like where the program has gone from these last twenty years or so. Well, you can add to that. I, I was sneaking into the games in the seventies. Yeah, there so, you go. So, so yeah. you know, I, I've seen the growth from a little bit further back than you can probably even imagine. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the simple answer to that is, of course, they can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the there's some really concerns. There's some big time concerns out there that I don't like. I don't like the portal at all. I, I, don't, um, I don't either. 
uh, it's bad for humans. Yeah. Um, that play sports. And so I, I just think it's a bad idea and I can get into it if you want, but Go for it. so far we're benefiting from a little bit of that, mm-hmm. not so much the portal, but guys being able to transfer and, and guys want to come here because the culture is so good Yeah, because they want to pass the ball and be basketball players instead of me, 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 me. Uh, and I think that's what, what, uh, Fuey and, and Tommy and Brian and, um, all these guys have, have been, you know, they've been building that for years. So yeah. it's neat to see it. I think we definitely have a chance, but, uh, you know, that tournament hits, you got to be playing well then, no matter what, even if you're by far the best team. Yeah, no, I think it's, speaking of this year with the Baylor game, I mean, they kind of hit lightning in a bottle. Not, not not that Baylor wasn't talented, but they played so good, that especially that first five minutes of that media timeout. I mean, they had 10 field goal attempts. We had three. We looked a little bit gassed. Um, but, yeah, I've always just – you know, Marvel, obviously I call the games of seeing where the program has gone and then kind of them making that next jump every five years. And now they're at, uh, they're getting the Chet Holmgrens, you know, the big kid that's probably going to be the number one pick. They're getting top top 50 guys left and right. They're getting guys decommitting from Kentucky and going to Gonzaga. It's just fascinating because, you know, my era, even David's era, a little bit, we were kind of diamond in the rough guys, right? Now it's like blue chip, blue chip, blue chip. Yeah. But I think they still need to find a mix, which few we will do is find a mix of four-year guys with blue chip. You know what I mean? The blue chip definitely has its peril, you know, that uh-huh. to, you know, fall of Rome. Yeah, Everybody thinks it's going to be done for them. Everybody thinks that it's just by showing up. And, and this, this, this school has built it by guys that have come in like you, blue collar working, um, work to be that not come in saying hey you know look at He's, me yeah yeah so i i think you have when you get these these blue chippers they got to be the right guys i think thought jalen fit into that i thought yeah he did um he came in and says like i want to be part of this rather than hey you all need to get on board that's mm-hmm. so um it might seem like a subtle difference but i think it's huge and it's a challenge it has to be we we've talked about in previous shows john real quick what what's his comp uh to an nba point guard that you know like jalen well do you know I don't know. Um, you, you see how you watch how he played in moments and you sit mm-hmm. there and go, well, that's why everybody, that's why everybody has him where they have him. Yeah. Uh, the things he's capable of doing, the confidence, the, um, the gamer part of him yeah. where he does it in big moments. He's not afraid of the moment. I mean, there's just, he, he has all the gifts. Um, and yet I still look at him a little bit like you talked about when I'd come back and play with you guys after all this experience and playing against, the best for years you look at it and go it's, he's still a kid yeah. and he is yeah so um you know his future's out there in front of him i think he has every talent to be as as good as as any of those guys yeah. you know take chris paul or any of these guys that are the, of the smaller type guards he's good at, could be as good as any of them or he could not um that's a good point yeah he, he's got a lot of work ahead of him he's got to pay attention a lot and stay humble and um, hopefully you can do all of those things. yeah i think he has all the physical tools i think um you know the shooting stuff everybody at a younger age, well, he needs to improve his jumps. Well, he will, you yeah. know, obviously. And then layup package, and I know you're a big component uh, teacher of that, is I think he needs to dial that in, and which guys can work on that. But that's something that needs to, you know, tighten the screws up a little bit because when you go against the trees at that level, you got to finish those, obviously, and you got to be efficient around the rim, you know, because yeah. they're going to chart all that stuff. Um, do they still, does Utah Jazz still send up their, their guards every once in a while too? Uh, they haven't in a while. Yeah. Uh, no, it's been a while. Yeah. Little context is they used to, like Darren Williams used to come up, like all their picks used to come up for a week, right? And you'd work work with them? Yeah, I wouldn't say all of them. I think uh, Alec Burks, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Darren, and then, let's see, Trey Burks. Yeah. Alan, Alec Burks, and I get the Burks and Burke yeah, yeah. mixed up. But those are the only guys they've ever sent up. Yeah. And, and that was fun. I mean, we brought guys out. I don't know if – did you come to one of those? I came to one of them, and I, I've told the story on the air um, when I was doing Learfield uh, IMG for Gonzaga, is you did a thing on which pass to throw when guys are cutting, with the back spin, oh, yeah. the side spin, like if where the defender is, if it needs to come back to the guy, if he's using the rim as a protector – and I thought it was fascinating because I, obviously I wasn't a point guard, so I was just like, fuck, throw me the ball. Just, you know what I mean? <laughs> just give me the ball. Just give me the ball. But it was it was crazy because you were talking about, you know, literally what type of spin you need where the defender is and if a guy that's barely open but you got to throw him open. Um, so I thought it was pretty cool. I, I remember you were working out Rav, and I think uh, David was probably in there when he was younger, you know what I mean? And, right. and um, But it was it was pretty cool that uh, 
you know, they still sent up their guys up to you. And, um, and that was fun. It's, it's, it's really fun. First of all, it's flattering that, that they (laughs) come and that they would think so. And so (laughs) it is fun, but it's hard to figure out what, because these kids are so talented. I never saw myself that way. Yeah. And so all I'm trying to do is when I've done it is, is share what I've thought. And it's, I wasn't thinking it while I was playing. I was mm-hmm. just playing, and you and, and you learn it. So to to kind of dive back into your in your own mind and say, well, okay, well, why did that work? Well, it worked because it had backspin on it, or it worked because you see this, or it worked because of that angle, and you just share it. And it's just in conversation. If they pick up on it and it helps them, great. If not, then I, there's really not much I can offer a guy that can, you know, jump up around yes. the rim. <laughs> That's a good point. So, what's the biggest thing you know as a point guard, like ball screen cover, like? Going against a ball screen, like what's the biggest thing? Just take take us through, like John Stockton's coming off a ball screen. What are you looking at first? Where the defender is? It starts with the guy that's guarding you. I mean, you you once you get used to handling the ball, you're you're not so much worried about the guy guarding you most mm-hmm. times. So you're trying to set him up. You're trying to get him to sit. You're trying to get him to get his hands down, hands up. What, whatever you're seeing, you're trying to encourage it. Um, you're trying not to get the screener to get a screen when he's coming over, so you have to be patient. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the toughest things. When you're getting dogged and you know you have to wait for the play, for example, if you're getting dogged, the guy's getting right up in mm-hmm. you, I would tell you, I, I was told as a young player, just go. You mm-hmm. know, Just go past him, get rid of that obstacle, and then use your instincts afterward. Well, at the end of a game, they don't want that. They don't. Nobody wants you to be running willy nilly because then you're. It's a. It's a cluster. Now, yeah, you got to set, set the play up. Or, you got to yeah, stay in. You got to somewhat stay in the f- format of the play. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you're only using yourself or one other guy. So you try to stay in the play, and you've got to hold that guy at bay while the play is developing. And that also means there might be guys cutting on the backside. You have to still be able to see, so you can't just turn your back. Mm-hmm. Anyway, screeners coming. Um, you try to set up this guy so he gets an easy screen. You're going to have to deal with the help defender there. He's either going to show out hard like, mm-hmm. a, like as if he was trapping or he's going to sit back and play center field or he's going to lock up. There's, I mean, there's a variety of different ways to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you got to be able to deal with that. The offside defender is going to be middle. Where are your shooters? What's the action on the weak side? Um, I'm probably just boring you with details there. No, but, it's – it's fantastic. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you want the right guy to get the right shot. If we could get it to Carl Malone, for example, <laughs> then that's the right play with the right guy. Yeah. And um, so you don't necessarily want your your non three point shooting five man getting the ball with one second left. Yeah. So there's absolutely. there's some thought in it. I remember the when I was a freshman, and obviously we talked about Blake earlier, and we were Blake was talking before the draft and he was talking to you about what he needed to work on as an NBA player. And one of the things that he told us that you said was, I thought it was hilarious, but it's true. He goes, what should I do with ball screens? He goes, well, as a defender, make sure you can guard a ball screen by yourself, which means just getting your hips through and getting over the top. Then your, your, um, you know, your help side defender, or you're the guy guarding the screener doesn't have to help the plays over. I just found that funny. It was like, that's the advice. Like, uh, basically, don't be a pussy. Just get over the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> just get over the top of it and the play's over. And I, I, I don't use that framing, but when I talk to my do- uh, girls, my daughter's team, I'm like, if you can just get over screens and not get screened, we take away a lot of help side defenders and things that, uh, you know, kids at this age can't do. Um, uh, so I always found it fascinating that you, I could just see you now just getting up into a guy and just <laughs> reaching over the top and Malone or whoever just sitting in the paint and then you don't have to guard the role. You don't have to help from the weak side. There's no late rotation and all that stuff. So um, last thing. So everybody for the Spokane listeners know that you, uh, when did you buy the warehouse? Wow. Uh, let's see. It's been operating now, I think for 19 or 20 years. So yeah. we probably bought it 23 years ago. 23 years ago. What? When you first got it, what was the idea? Sell it. Really? Yeah. We, I had a realtor friend who, who said, um, look, I've got this thing that I can turn over in a couple months and make you a few bucks. You interested? Mm-hmm. I said, oh, okay. You know, yeah. he's a good long, long time friend and yeah, I yeah. trust him. I said, sure, let's do it. Well, six months passed, a year passed. I said, what are we doing with this building? You know, I thought we were selling. He goes, yeah, you know, things didn't work out. Da, 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 da. Two, three years later, I ran into a guy in Salt Lake, um, very wealthy guy who sold a phone company or something who started doing this thing at Cottonwood High School where um, he built a batting facility, you know, mm-hmm. for baseball. Yeah. And I just told him about this gym, and he looked at it, and he said, unbelievable. Right there, that would be an unbelievable baseball bat. It'd be, it'd be state-of-the-art. It'd be the best. And 
maybe in the world, and you'd only have to use this space. I went, really? So I said, okay, well, we took a look at that. And then I said, well, I have the jazz court, um, which is a long story I can get into if you want to, but I have the the full-length jazz court that was used in the Salt Palace just sitting in store. And I said, well, maybe we can put that in the other part. Mm-hmm. Well, things started falling into place. I didn't know you could raise a roof of a 20,000-square-foot building, but we raised the roof nine feet. Um, put basketball courts in it, and there we go. So it wasn't intended. It was only because it didn't sell that the ID even had a chance. <laughs> How'd you buy the uh, the jazz court? I didn't buy it. I offered to buy it. What happened was the 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 Delta Center opened. Mm-hmm. Salt Palace closed. Um, brand new court, brand new facility. We're playing Phoenix that night, and the four warped. Canceled the game. I still remember the ref just cursing, saying, "Now we're done. We're not playing it because the four warped." Yeah. So the team scrambles. They have to order another court. Meanwhile, they move the Salt Palace court over to the Delta Center mm-hmm. while the other one's being shipped. The one that's being shipped crashes. <laughs> the truck crashes <laughs> with the court on it. So it's, you know, a couple months out. So we play nearly the whole season uh, with the Salt Palace floor in the Delta Center. I happened to be walking through there one day when they were changing it out. And I immediately called Larry Miller, the owner. I said, what are you doing with the old four? He says, no, we're selling it back to the, you know, you trade back, mm-hmm. you trade him. Yeah. And I said, whatever you're trading it in for, I'd like to buy it. And he said, okay, fair enough. And, but he never, he never did one. He, he never uh, sent you a bill. He never wanted to buy for it at the end. He, and he did it and uh, put it in storage for me for 10 years or something. And there you go. That's awesome. Yeah. It's cool that the, so we practice at the warehouse and the kids get to play on it. It's cool. It's yeah. Delta center. You know what I mean? Jazz floor and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, John, I appreciate you coming in. Um, you know, the reason why I brought up the warehouse, you know, I, I said it at my Jersey deal. Um, you know, just having that, what you've done for Spokane sports, like in general, I mean, I really mean that is, is fantastic. I grew up playing on the carpet floors in elementary. I mean, yeah. we had no gym space. It was a hundred bucks an hour to pay the janitor fees. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we used to have to go to Mountain View for games. We never had tournaments here. Um, so what you've done with the warehouse and just making Spokane sports accessible to kids, not just basketball, volleyball, there's pickleball in there. You mentioned uh, uh, baseball as well. It's been fantastic for this community. So I want you to know that uh, it's been great. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean that because it's we didn't have gym space. We really didn't, and we never had tournaments, like I said. So to be able to, to offer that at – you know, little to no cost for uh, teams around the area and the accessibility and, and you know, the way you guys tournaments and now you have the streaming thing, which is unbelievable in there. Uh, you know, you can stream the games. So, right. so I was in Indian and got to watch my daughter play live up to date cameras moves. It's great. Um, so I just wanted to thank you publicly for that. Uh, just to, from Spokane in well, general. Thank you. Thank well, you. yeah, no, I mean, it needs, needs to be said though. I think people don't realize, uh, you know, those buildings ain't cheap to run. The liability <laughs> <laughs> ain't fun. Um, so, you know, we always appreciate you uh, letting us come in there as well. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. It's been fun. The warehouse has been fun. And had Kerry Pickett ran it for, what, he and his wife, Jenny, mm-hmm. ran it for 19 years. And Jared came yeah, Jared. up with the, uh, the, uh, the video stuff for you. So, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's nice to have people you can count on doing those things for you. Well, it's beautiful. It's, it's good for the community. So uh, thanks again, John, for coming on. My pleasure, Mo. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. If you enjoyed this episode of The Perimeter, make sure to go check out Sack and Jack, featuring two Zag alums, one from the court, Robert Zachary, and one from the booth, Jack Ferris. At Sack and Jack, find it wherever you listen to podcasts. The Perimeter with Adam Morrison is brought to you in partnership with Speak Studios and Mercedes of Spokane.